becoming. Um, this piece is called Heart Center, and uh, away we go. She was dying in a closet. Dina Alvarado had AIDS and was spending her last moments on earth in a large closet, about six by eight, adjacent to a large room that served as a bedroom for recovering drug addicts. She was ill and needed a place to die. Banner Place was a well-known recovery house for LGBT people. Banner Place had probably seen its shares of AIDS deaths or overdoses. They offered to take her in. Dina was a trans woman who had developed a reputation for helping others. In our nonprofit circles, she was stellar. She was particularly known for helping other HIV positive trans women. She was a case manager who helped women find food, shelter, or medical services. It was devastating to hear that she was in the late stages of AIDS. This was not in the 1980s or 1990s. This was 2010, when AIDS was no longer a disease, but considered a chronic one. No one in the United States was supposed to die of AIDS anymore. When I'd met her 12 years before, she was radiantly beautiful. She was small boned with dark hair and eyes. She was the kind of trans woman who could have flown stealth or passed as biologically female. Passing is something that is innate in many marginalized communities. The art of being invisible is a form of survival. I tried to pass as straight. It kept me safer. I embrace being gay, but appearing straight acting can be a lifesaver. I tried, still try, to pass as American. I have this Filipino face and have been in the United States for over 50 years. In a crowd, I'll speak first, showing anyone around how good my English is, as if to say, see, I'm an American too. I'd known several trans women who chose to pass. Once they tra transitioned, they disappeared, gratefully leading an anonymous life. A few trans friends have said to me, don't tell anyone I'm trans. My neighbors don't know. The secret was always safe with me. The secret meant a life free from harassment, danger. This was not Dina Alvarado. Letting the world know she was transgender was her act of survival, a full embrace of herself. I met her because she competed in a pageant, a very special pageant. Unlike other pageants where beauty and dresses took center stage, this pageant emphasized surface service to the community and being an inspiration to other trans women, particularly youth. This was a popular, this was a population prone to suicide. And since no one would hire them, prostitution was a survival job. Violence was a part of their daily existence. Dina won the pageant, looking like a young Sophia Loren. She was strong, glowing, fierce. I was the press person for the pageant. I did media trainings for the candidates. A big prize for winning was the cover of an LGBTQ magazine and appearances at public events. She had to be presentable, media savvy, and personable. She had to be, well, a pageant queen. Dina was all of this. That's why it was devastating seeing her emo emaciated and unable to speak. By that time, I'd been doing AIDS work for 20 years. I'd seen some of the most vibrant people reduced to mere shadows of themselves. Every time I think I could handle seeing this, every time I was wrong. It's always hard, always excruciatingly sad. What made it difficult was that the people dying were so incredibly young. I hated that Dina was dying in a closet, but was also quite surprised. Her room, 
was filled with at least a dozen Buddhas of various sizes. A large Buddha was tattooed onto her torso. I had no idea she'd been studying Buddhism. This is not surprising. Religion isn't talked much about in queer communities. In a Pew Research poll, more than 50% of LGBT people didn't identify with a religion. In the general population, that number is only 20%. I was raised Catholic and sang the church choir. There are a lot of gay men in choir. I looked out from the choir loft and saw a huge image of Jesus and I knew he loved me. The men below, not so much. How many of us gay men sang our hearts out for God only to be vilified at the pulpit? Half of LGBT people didn't turn away from God. They were forced away. I was this person. One of the last hopes for the church disappeared when I heard a priest I knew refused last rites to a man who was dying of AIDS. Last rites is a crucial death ritual in the Catholic church. They are the last prayers given shortly before death. I couldn't believe this was denied. I remember in deep quiet and in my despair, kneeling before God, I asked what to do. I couldn't be part of the institution that didn't seem to want me. I felt like a battered lover begging for my spouse to forgive me. On my knees, I felt God say, there are other ways to find me. Permission. I heard permission. Thus, my journey to explore another way of believing came to be. By the time I saw Dina again, I'd been practicing a Buddhist, I, I was a practicing Buddhist for some years, finding spiritual fulfillment there in a way I hadn't before. I started to pursue Buddhism because they had no scriptural, scriptural evidence to hate gay people. Part of my training in the Dharma or Buddhist teachings was attending a training on Buddhist death rituals. I felt compelled to guide Dina through a vis visualization I was taught. See the Buddha in front of you, I whispered to Dina. He's shimmering and bright, taking the form of Buddha of limitless light. Dina's eyes were nearly closed. I didn't know if she could hear me. Focus on Buddha's heart. See yourself traveling towards Buddha's heart. Aim for it. If you've meditated, now is a good time to use it. Just concentrate on Buddha's heart center. When you aim for Buddha's heart, don't be distracted by other voices. People might be calling you back. You might hear them crying for you to return, or, or you might feel the pull of pets if you have them. You might hear them bark or whimper. Don't listen. Just keep moving forward. This ritual was about moving on, letting go. Impermanence is a Buddhist concept drilled into me. God is change, wrote Octavia Butler in Parable of the Sower, one of my favorite novels. Suffering is caused when we refuse to let go, refuse to accept change. Just move, Dina. Go. Do you understand? Gotcha, she said, her eyes widening. She appeared fully awake. This surprised me. She was listening. Good, I said. Focus on Buddha's heart. Aim for it. She died two years, two days later. When her memorial was held, the priest kept referring to Dina as he. 
The room was filled with LGBT activists in a hall in West Hollywood. For most of us, we were used to calling out people who didn't use the proper pronoun, but the room was filled with Dina's family. No one wanted to disrupt the memorial to correct the priest. Frankly, I think we were also tired. I knew many in the room who had been doing AIDS work for a long time. We knew grief and we were tired. When my father died, I arranged the funeral. Grief from losing a parent was unbearable. It also pushed me in the right direction. My father was not a religious man, but he was dying and he wanted to be closer to God. He fell back into his Catholicism, not out of passion, but familiarity. I didn't want that for myself. Upon my death, I wanted to feel fully invested. In the back of my mind, I knew that would be Buddhism. I worked in the Asian community for a while. I called myself a professional Asian, unlike so many other fellow Buddhist converts, most of whom were not Asian and felt they, they, they floundered finding a Buddhist community to connect with. I found them easily in places where I worked and played. I felt more comfortable in a Buddhist temple where my Asian face was welcomed. I did not feel that way in the churches I grew up in with priests who seemed to prefer the white parishioners than treated the Filipinos sort of like pets. What bothered me was there were Filipinos who didn't mind that. Growing up, I'd been called pretty. Girls often asked if I, were, if I wore eyeliner because my lashes were so dark, my lips were, were full, and more than a few people had said I could make an attractive woman. I took it as both a compliment and an insult. Some of my favorite male idols were pretty, even beautiful. From 1950s matinee idol Montgomery Clift to model Cord Baptiste, these men would not be considered rugged or brawny. They were mostly elegant, sophisticated types, the kind of man I'd want to be. However, as an Asian man, I knew of the feminization of Asian men is rooted in colonial bigotry. The idea of an Asian man being considered pretty can be considered an insult in certain circles. I was left with a conundrum. I was a man who liked being called pretty, but hated being seen as a pretty Asian man. Now that I'm older, this doesn't bother me as much, perhaps because I'm also less pretty. My ex Jennifer and I agreed to have lunch. We hadn't seen each other in a while. One of the reasons we broke up was because she had an amazing opportunity to work in San Francisco, a city she dreamed of living for a long time. Well, San Angeles is my home and couldn't see myself leaving it. Jennifer looked great. Her hair was upswept into a bun. She seemed happy with her new life in the Bay Area. She got her law degree from Harvard, but never practiced. She made her career writing about law as a journalist. She and I met in a group, in a running group, even trained for a marathon together. When we met, she was a man. We don't use her dead name. Still, I wonder what would have happened if she had remained a man and not transitioned to female. We broke up, yes, because she moved to San Francisco, but because she wanted to be what she needed to be, a woman. When we were together, she liked to dress up as a woman, but gay men did that. When she started to come out as transgender, I tried to be supportive. However, transitioning can be tough. She went on hormones, which influenced her emotions. Before, when we would get into a fight, we'd both yell at each other, maybe throw things. Now she was a woman. When we'd get into a fight, I'd yell, and she'd cry. Being in a relationship with a woman would make us a heterosexual couple, something this gay man who worked very hard to accept his gayness was not willing to participate in. I've told this story to some transgender friends who were disappointed in me. Wasn't the person I was in a relationship with the same person as when she transitioned? Wasn't she even better now that she was, she was truly herself? Was a cock that important to me? I felt like I had let down my ideals. It's the inside that matters, a phrase that had been drilled into me since childhood. 
In theory, that sounds pleasant, but the outside matters a little, maybe even a lot. I am not romantically attracted to a woman's body. In Buddhism, there are tales of gender bending all the time. Kuan Yin in Mahayana Buddhism is a woman who used to be a man. Kuan Yin is a major queer symbol for this very reason. She embodies the very essence of compassion. When Dina was dying in that closet with Buddha statues in her room and Buddha tattooed to her torso, I wondered if she knew this. She and others like her are a part of Buddhist history. Dina transitioned to womanhood, then committed acts of kindness, compassion. By meeting Dina, I had met Kuan Yin. Thank you. Okay, that was deeply unfair because I'm sobbing now. <laughs> so, <laughs> oh, God. You're so sweet. No, I'm like laughing and now I'm sobbing. So we'll see if I can pull it together. So, so beautiful. Thank you. Thank you very uh, much. Mm. All right. Delaunay Michelle was raised in a South Louisiana literary family that includes her first cousin, Andre Dubu. Dubu, <laughs> like abuse, Dubu, yeah. and second cousin, James Lee Burke. While working as an actor in Los Angeles in 1996, what else would you do in Los Angeles? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I know how you get back into Los Angeles. I love okay. you. I know. <laughs> um, Delani created the critically acclaimed reading series Spoken Interludes to sold out audiences that continue today. She then developed, taught in, and continued to run outreach writing programs for at risk youth in inner city schools, juvenile situations, and prisons in New York and LA. Thank you, Delana, for your work. The first story Ms. Michelle wrote won the Thomas Wolfe Short Fiction Award. Her nonfiction work has been featured on NPR, and her first two novels were published by Harper Collins. She is currently working on a memoir. Please welcome Delaunay Michelle. Thank you, Noel. That was so sweet of you to read. It gave me a few minutes to pull myself together. And we'll see if I did. I don't, I don't really think I have, but that's all right. Um, so this is it's from the memoir that I'm working on that's in progress. And I thought it was called The Mattress Ball and now it's not, so we'll see. But I really appreciate y'all being here tonight and uh, hearing this means a lot as I appreciate y'all hearing Noel and Jean's stories. Okay. There were two things my mama never was, still or quiet. So when I got home from my trip on New Year's Day and walked into the terrible rental house we'd been living in since I, she left daddy a few months before, and I saw her sitting in the living room, not moving or saying a word, I worried she'd had some kind of stroke. Then she turned and the rage on her face made me realize it was me who was gonna have one. And all my 15 years, mama had never waited before screaming at me. So I'd never been more afraid, especially since I didn't know what it was this time sit down. Her voice was as rigid as her posture in the wing chair her best friend had lent us since daddy hadn't let mama take anything when we left. The furniture Helen had sent from her boutique was like ours at home, but it was so much nicer than the wood panel dark rental house that it just ended up making the place look worse, like gone with the wind furniture on a Grapes of Wrath set. As I sat on the sofa, mama said, are you having an affair with Frank Bricado? I nearly slipped off the smooth silk seat. It felt like she had thrown a grenade of Frank at me and the sharp points of everything that had been happening since last fall were exploding inside me. A few months before at the beginning of the fall, when I had started 10th grade, my four older sisters all moved away for college or for careers and mama left daddy taking me with her. 
in the South Louisiana world that I grew up in, my parents were famous, appearing regularly in the state time society pages for their parties, or just in at home photos with their five daughters, including my first appearance in one at three months old. Daddy's family started in Louisiana with Captain Jacques Michel, Louis XIV's ambassador to New Orleans, while Mama's family included Commodore Perry and her grandfather, Walter Burke, a senator who intimidated even Huey Long. In addition to Daddy's magnetic business savvy and Mama's Elizabeth Taylor-esque beauty, plus the popular newspaper columns she wrote on marriage and family, they were civic leaders and art patrons who led renowned marriage retreats for the Catholic diocese. So the shattering of Beth and Melvin Michelle's perfect family immediately became Baton Rouge society's favorite long running scandal. Adults I hardly knew would stop me to tell me with barely concealed glee, the latest gossip about them that they'd heard while well, my parents used me in the divorce like two cats batting around a half dead mouse. Eight weeks of this, after mom and I moved out, I had a nervous breakdown. My therapist pulled me from 10th grade at the private all girl Catholic high school I attended to get a rest, but I still plunged into a suicidal depression. All I longed for was a shoulder to cry on. And I really hated that I did. I couldn't believe that that phrase, that cliche, a shoulder to cry on, was actually a real thing a person could crave. And I tried everything I could to not meet that. Mama had told me when we moved out that it was fine with her for me to smoke. So I quickly worked up to a pack a day. She also included me when her friends would come over for cocktails almost nightly. Around them, I was treated like another fabulous divorcee but once they left, Mama screamed at me like I was her scullery maid. As desperately as I tried to deaden myself with cigarettes and gin, I couldn't escape that longing for a shoulder to cry on. And Frank had been pursuing me since August. He was the much older brother of Sam, a hairdresser I modeled for, who, well, he looked like he could fill in for Michelangelo's David statue if it ever needed a rest. It was like that. Um, I was in love with Sam and dreamed of being with him when I finally finished high school. But every time I went by the salon to see Sam, Frank was there and he'd run out after me to talk by my car. He wasn't gorgeous like Sam. He was cute. Um, tasseled hair and dark eyes that would stare into mine with this warmth that I had gotten so unused to seeing, uh, it would almost stop my breath. Then he'd take my hand between his strong ones, holding them, and promise me he'd be the best friend I'd ever have if I let him. Now, I wasn't stupid. I knew what he meant. And the idea of committing adultery, actually even just having sex, terrified me. Especially since the only two times I'd ever had sex was when I was raped once by Frank, soon after I met him in August, when he plied me with drinks at a party. But I also knew that if I didn't get a shoulder to cry on, I was gonna kill myself or go crazy. And they both kind of seemed about the same. So I decided I would just see Frank for a little bit until I could get a hold of myself and then I'd stop before my soul was ruined and before anyone found out, but mama, of course found out after only about two weeks. As I sat on the couch across from her, mama's blue eyes stared down into my soul and I knew she could see how dark it had already gotten from my sin. Are you having an affair with him? She asked again. There was no way I could hide from her. Yeah. She nodded. Well, your phone kept ringing while you were gone, so I answered it. Frank thought I was you, then hung up when he realized I wasn't, but I heard enough. I recognized his voice from when he cleaned up the backyard here. Mama didn't say like a common laborer, but she didn't have to. For Mama, that was almost as unforgivable as everything else. In early October, not long before we, after we moved into the rental house, I got home from school one day 
and mama told me that the owner had finally listened to her complaints and sent a man over to haul all the debris away that was out back. When mama went outside to tell this man what to do, Frank introduced himself to her. So she said, oh, are you related to Sam Ricardo, the hairdresser I modeled for? Of all people to clean out the yard, mama had said to me as I leaned against the counter in the empty kitchen since Helen hadn't lent us the breakfast table and chairs. Such a funny coincidence, Sam's older brother. Hearing Sam's name was like turning on the radio when a Rolling Stones song came on from an album I wished I had, and for those moments it felt like I did. Frank said he met you, Mama said. Sam screeched to a halt in my head. Mama was near the stove, but she hadn't taken her eyes off me. I opened the fridge, pretending to look for food, even though we both knew I wouldn't eat. Did he? Mama walked over and shut the fridge door, her face close to mine. I guess maybe the salon sometime. Well, he certainly seemed to remember you. My chest sparked a deep red. I grabbed my school books from the counter and could feel Mama's eyes on me as I left the room. I've been trying to forget that Frank existed, just like I'd been trying to forget what had happened on that August night with him. But only hours earlier, while I had been at school, he was in the backyard. He'd even met Mama. I could picture him out there, hauling stuff around his jeans and T-shirt, the way his muscles showed through them, same as he had worn that August night when he looked so out of place at that party for Sam's new salon, same way Sam would have looked out of place cleaning out our backyard in a silk shirt and linen pants. Well, Delaunay, Mama was sitting poised in the wing chair as though her rage was a new kind of posture. I was bracing myself for her screaming to begin. Then it hit me, maybe she already had been screaming about finding out that I was seeing Frank all that time that I was out of town. I thought of the hours long phone call she'd make every night that I had to listen to through the flimsy walls as she told half of Baton Rouge every detail of the divorce always finishing with what a bastard my daddy was and how he didn't love me, never had, and her leaving him was all his fault. But at least I hadn't been home to hear that. But then I realized that since I had admitted to seeing Frank, the phone call I was gonna have to hear was her calling the cops. And my, my stomach got woozy as I wondered what I was gonna have to tell them. And then thinking about the trouble Frank was gonna get in. Mama steepled her fingers together and looked at me over the cage of her hands. It's fine with me that you see Frank, she said. I'm not going to stop you. My eyes widened in shock as I stared at her and she gazed at me with a cool defiance. I just hope you know what you're doing. And she got up and left the room. I listened as she walked down the hall and shut her bedroom door closed. Then all sounds of my mother stopped as though she had vanished into a different realm and didn't exist anymore in the terrible rental house or at least didn't exist anymore as my mother. Two weeks later in her popular newspaper column on marriage and child rearing, my mother wrote this. I think the way adults mislead youth about sex is the worst. Sex is not a casual encounter. It is a complex exchange of personalities, emotion, and commitment. While I think young people, while young people think they can mate freely without consequences, psychological research proves them wrong. Sex carries with it a kind of imprinting. As you grow older, you realize the effects of another person imprinted on you. I worry not only for my own children, but for all young people. But I wonder maybe she wasn't too worried about me. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, Jean McCulloch is a former managing editor of the Paris Review, a senior editor of Ten House, and the founding editorial director of Ten House Books. She is the co-founder of the Toto Santos Writers Workshop. Her work has appeared in the Paris Review, Tin House, the New York Times Book Review, Vogue, O Magazine, Allure, the Northwestern Review, and other publications. Her memoir, All Happy Families, was published by HarperCollins in 2018. She lives in Brooklyn, New York. 
The piece she is reading tonight is titled Snow in the Night Sky. Please help me welcome Jean. Thank you. Hi, everybody. It's an honor to be here. And those both of those pieces were just exquisite. So I'm, I loved sitting back and hearing them all. Um, I'm going to write an essay that I just finished fairly recently. And I just wanted to say a little bit about it in the beginning. I was commissioned to write this piece for an anthology. Um, it's going to be the second anthology in a series called Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books. And I'm giving it that shout out because I know you guys are going to be hosting Zibby Owens, the creator of that soon. Um, I had asked them what they wanted me to write on because often I find a little prompt can help. Uh, and they said friendship. And then I immediately regretted <laughs> that I had asked them because I, I kind of drew a blank. And all I could think of in my mind's eye as I sat down was an image of Winnie the Pooh and Piglet wandering through the thousand acre wood together. And I couldn't really come up with anything um, until I, I realized there was one person I had always, always wanted to write about. And I had really never found the form in which to do it. So I was grateful for the opportunity. So this is Snow in the Night Sky. The message was written in spidery hand on a scrap of paper ripped from a legal pad, the edges ragged. It lay on the table in an in unfamiliar kitchen held down by a coffee mug. I'd gone with my boyfriend, maybe he was already my fiance, to visit his aunt in Weekapog, Rhode Island. She lived alone in the family house and barely spoke a word to us. Though from time to time, we heard her moving along the halls upstairs, the wood creaking the uneven floorboards in the dark house as the wind blew off the sea. We were just 24. Your sister called to tell you Snow is dead. That was the message. I didn't see the lugubrious aunt again after that. I got on a train back to New York for the funeral of my best friend. Her real name wasn't Snow, it was Kathy. But Kathy didn't do justice to her flaxen blonde hair. It was just too plain a name. We tried for a long time to come up with a counterpart for me, but my red brown hair only conjured words like rust and Irish setter. For a while we tried terracotta. We liked the romantic sound of it, but it was really too much of a mouthful. Our mothers had met dropping us off at Sunday school in the local Episcopal church and bonded over the fact we'd all just arrived in New York from Europe and were beginning schools across the street from each other on the Upper East Side. Snow was going to the more conservative school where in 1968 girls wore Nixon buttons pinned in their hair ribbons. And I was going to the more progressive where we wore black armbands and canvassed the Yorktown neighborhood for social studies credit. It's been said that you do not make friends, you recognize them. What did we recognize? A way of being easy with each other, I suppose. A love of the madcap. Shaky Super 8 movie footage shows us dashing around in my family's living room, wearing my mother's fur coats, the hems puddling at our feet. When Snowflake the albino gorilla graced the cover of National Geographic magazine, we spent entire Saturday afternoons in white turtlenecks and ballet tights, our hair tucked in to my mother's white latex bathing caps, perched on the arms of club chairs and backs of couches, munching imaginary bananas. We invented a language and went bois, 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 that only albino gorillas could speak. On Sunday mornings, 
we zipped maroon choir robes over our neon striped mini dresses and fishnet tights and walked demurely up the aisle of the church, taking care not to let our chain belts clang against our hymnals as we walked. The spring we were 12, Madison Avenue opened to pedestrian traffic on Monday evenings to encourage retail and families emerged from innocuous apartment buildings to congregate in the street. Mothers in sensible shoes walked family dogs, some smoked cigarettes. Sales girls from the cosmetic shop on 76th Street and the bakery on 73rd Street would stand on the curb offering free samples. Snow and I would watch the sky as the evening came on making our pilgrimage to Baskin and Robbins on 84th Street. She could only stay out until nightfall. So as we walked, we found names for the darkening sky. Faded denim, Robin's egg blue, royal blue, brand new denim, sapphire, indigo. At indigo, we turn around. It's not technically dark yet, I'd say. I still see some blue up there. There's still some light. So we'd linger eating our cones, then slowly turn down a side street and head back to the corner of Lexington and 72nd Street to drop snow off with her doorman. In March, the city unfreezes slowly, unsteadily. Yet one day, the sun melts the piles of snow into slush and the smell of fresh earth lightly tinges the air. It was one of those March evenings. As spring began, green shoots of daffodils pushing through the frozen ground, that I realized night held all the hope of possibility of our future. When you're 12 years old, you can think like that because everything seems on the brink. Our bodies were changing and high school would soon begin. I heard my mother describe this syndrome to Snow's mother one day on the phone. Get ready, our butterflies are getting ready to test their wings, she said. She meant it as a maternal warning, I realized, because she added, fasten your seatbelt. But looking back now, I realized we were becoming butterflies that spring. She was right. We were emerging slowly from cocoons, our wings still curled up against us as we planned our course of flight. We both had artistic dreams. We'd lie in bed on our weekend sleepovers and tell each other grand plans, our hands dancing in the air as we constructed futures for ourselves. I was to be a writer, she was to be a painter, and she surely would have been a gifted one. She tossed it lightly, but her talent was recognized early on. By the time she got to Yale, she was named scholar of the house in the art department. I remember at the time thinking of addiction as a big house, a house with loud music playing all the time, drowning out the sound of the phone ringing when those of us on the outside <clears throat> called. It was hectic in there, groups of damaged souls dancing and spinning into walls with chaotic euphoria. Soon after we graduated from college, snow slipped into that house quickly when I wasn't looking. Where the hell was I? Why was I not pounding on the door of the house, demanding she come out? I was on the outside somewhere, busy starting my own life living in a tiny apartment on Horatio Street with a tall man and a magazine job that included petty cash. In the last picture I have of Snow, she's standing with her dog, Travis, and a boy she met in art school. Her jeans are splattered with paint and rolled above her ankles. Her blonde hair is matted, cut short in uneven chunks around her face as if she'd taken scissors to it in the dark. She had a column of rubber bands around her ankles and more on her wrists. Her car keys hung on a ribbon around her neck. 
The image of that chaotic house kept coming back to my mind at her funeral and at the reception after in my family's living room. I saw myself outside that house and I could not forgive myself for not looking up long enough to see her as she wafted by the window as if that would lure her out. Even when I knew she was struggling, still I was standing outside with my hands in my pockets, staring down at the rough pavement, accepting the boundaries that she'd put up. The coroner reported pneumonia as the cause of death. And I imagine her body was so emaciated by then from heroin use that anything could have taken her out. The train rumbled through the Connecticut countryside later that day as I returned to my tall fiance waiting in Rhode Island. Slowly the lights in the farmhouses along the route came on. The sky a faded denim blue. Still time to hang out, Snow would say. It's technically only dusk. Light lingers long in the New England summer sky. Gradually, the clouds went from lavender to ash. 10 minutes later, as we neared the New Haven station, the sky darkened to royal blue, then slowly to sapphire. Even so, there was an astonishing light that night. A profusion of stars promised clear weather ahead. There's no reason to leave yet, I was thinking. We can linger. There's so much left to do. But I was tra traveling through the New England indigo night alone. The boys of our youth, now men in their 60s, still speak of snow to me. The boy with the yellow socks, now a defense lawyer in San Francisco. The boy with the madras jacket and the buck teeth, now a screenwriter in LA, the jazz musician. As they speak, a light sparks and redirects. They're rummaging in their deep past for a glimpse of the golden girl none of them could catch, the pale goddess of their fevered adolescent imaginations. Always they ask, did you see it coming? Did I see it coming? After 40 years, still I think of snow when I look at the darkening sky. I wondered what her art would be like if our kids would know each other, if we teach them our monkey talk. And if she suddenly appeared, what we would say. But I do know one thing. I know we'd recognize each other. That was so beautiful. Thank you, Jean. Would everybody like to undo? And we can thank Jean and Noel for such beautiful, beautiful pieces. Thank you all. So much. Thank you. If anybody wants to tell a joke now, they're welcome. To. <laughs> <laughs> well, we should have had something planned. Um, quickly, something. Turn up the heat. Laura, you got one. <laughs> well, I, I don't want to tell I don't want to tell a joke, but I worked at the Baskin Robbins on 84th Street when you were oh. going there with your friend, Jean. Oh my That's god. Fabulous. <laughs> that was That's my so first funny. job. That was the first Baskin Robbins in New York. And That's I right. And that was my first job. And uh, bubblegum ice cream was a phenomenon. People it people Oh god, that's right. Yeah. I I was partial to the jamoka fudge almond myself. Yeah, that was very but good. But now uh, that you mentioned the bubble gum, I remember it. <laughs> wow, well, that was weird. Bubble gum. But thank you, thank you, thank all of you for these wonderful pieces. Yeah. Really beautiful, beautiful work. Thank you. Yeah. Well, I'm so so happy that we were all together, and I loved the um, the beautiful symmetry of. Noel and Jean's pieces, I thought were really amazing. Um, feeling very Thank you so much. The life tonight. So, so moving and so powerful. Oh. All well, of you, so gifted. Thank, thank, thank you, you for coming. And, and 
Delaney, thank you so much for, for having us. I, I love the tradition and I love the impulse that started it of people reading works in progress because I don't think any of us do enough of that anymore. Mm -hmm. And it's one of the silver linings, I guess, of this pandemic is we're all on Zoom now, which makes it possible to really share work. So thank you for thank creating you. this. Yeah, I appreciate that. And, and I love that, you know, here in New York, I get to ask no because he's an old man. I get to marry my my <laughs> families, my LA and New York. So this just feels brilliant. So everybody meet because I love all of you. And um, and so uh, we'll have another one. I somehow miss February. Oops but I'll try to do better and we'll put one together for April and hope to see you there. Uh, and thank y'all for giving us this time tonight, being with us and just being in this circle of, of heart center, this title, yeah. you know, on this beautiful evening sky. So there you go. I wrapped it all up. Thank, thank, thank you. So thank, you. Thank, thank you so much. Bye-bye. Thank Thanks. Thanks so much, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank